Welcome to the API Resilience Podcast. If you've ever wondered what it really is we do when we do APIs, and if you've wondered how APIs change organizations, our communities, and our society, look no further. This is the podcast you've been searching for. I'm Christophe van Tomme, and together with my co-host Mark Bergauer and our guests, we explore how deliberate complexity, social practice theory, and a deeper understanding of social technical systems can transform our organizations and the world we live in. In this episode, our guest is Kenny Bashwegle, a strategic software delivery consultant and software architect with a focus on social technical systems. Kenny blends IT approaches like domain-driven design and continuous delivery with conflict resolution methods like deep democracy. He facilitates organizational change through a range of visual and collaborative modeling practices like event storming, widely mapping, and context mapping. We have split this interview into two episodes. In this first episode, we will discuss the role domain-driven design and complexity awareness have in Kenny's work. Um, what do you think is your role in creating coherence in organizations as an architect? How um, how are you doing that exactly? Well, first of all, do you think that's important? Um, and um, and then also like how how are you approaching that, or like how is that connected to your job uh, in organizations? Yeah, so my job is, uh, well, going down several scopes in the organization, and I'm not sure where I heard it first, right? The, the social technical system or the and, and the levels of scope and uh, Jacques, I can I cannot pronounce his full name, like the, the, the timing of... Uh, Elliot Jacks. Elliot Jack, yeah, thank you. So I, I know Root talks, uh, Root Milan talks a lot about them, and I know you uh, you do as mm-hmm. well, and and... For me, I like to sit on, on team level and between team level, and I and I say specifically between because I don't like to use the word the, the hierarchical work mm-hmm. or on top of it because I want to get that hierarchy out, but it's a, a scoping thing, and I think that's important. and And I like uh, I like that talk, the TED talk about systems. Um, you know, I see the teams working as parts in a system. And we need to make sure the parts fit together. And what I see in and in, and in, in Mark talked about is that autonomy is really individualizing things, right? That mm-hmm. I've had a team as a consultant that says, "Yeah, we are all in charge of our own backlog." Well, that's great. And now they need to change something also on an organizational level. Some responsibilities needs to be flipped, right? Instead of we need to solve this. If, if something happens, we need to solve it now, but if we're going for like an event driven, then they need to solve it. So that also means that they need to flip the responsibility. Yeah, we cannot do that because they uh, own their own backlog. Okay, so you're actually stuck with parts that don't fit anymore. So you need to have someone helping with that, uh, facilitating that and helping with that solution. Where do the responsibilities sit? And that that is, uh, the, the the enterprise or domain architecture, as as you see in the sco- mm-hmm. levels of scope that Ruth Milan talks about, and and I like to be in between that and keep facilitating that to keep it coherent with each other. So I think that's important, and I see it with my cus- uh, current customer as well, where the same thing happens, right? Uh, where PO talks about responsibilities, but are not totally they don't see what the impact is on the architecture if, if something is flipped and the architecture sees it in a, sometimes in a different way on a more technical level. But I think that coherence is really important and especially setting boundaries, of course. And I think, so I've got this hypothesis that's uh, in, in the API landscape. So there's, there's been two really big trends. Uh, well, there's a lot of trends, but two big trends that I want to focus on. One, one is API first. And we talked a little bit about this with, uh, with Jay Bloom also, that um, basic, or my assumption is that organizations are trying to replicate Amazon, where they've seen like, oh, you just, you take your small teams and you put APIs around them. And then everybody just keeps creating APIs all mm-hmm. over the place and it's going to be fantastic. And you're going to have a platform, great. And and Jim basically was saying, but that's actually not a platform. Actually, um, AWS is not a platform. It's a bunch of computing primitives, and they're they're not really coherent because they're um, there's just a bunch of stuff. And and if you want to create a platform out of that, you have to 
fit the pieces together and configure them in specific ways. So th there's this one trend, and then the, the other trend uh, that, that specifically is happening in the API space is this paved road to production, which is uh, the thing to facilitate this API first, which is we're going to make infrastructure, make it really, really easy to make lots of APIs. And that's great. Uh, and like it's it's great to to reduce friction in these processes, but at the same time it feels a little bit like so the second order effect from these two trends is going to be just a bunch of API soup um, that that's not really cohering. Is is this something you're seeing? Because you're you're seeing this better than yeah than me, I think, um, in organizations. Yeah, so so I have a background in software engineering, actually electro engineering, mm -hmm. where you already had sort of like microservices, right, mm -hmm. fit together. So when I got into the software space, I'm like, why isn't this so? Why is this so unstructured, right? Because well, there's a lot of social interaction too, and that that doesn't happen on the on on the sprint board. Um, but as a, a, a what I usually see in the software engineering space, and I teach a lot of domain driven design, where mm -hmm. we mostly discuss about domain models and their responsibilities towards uh, well, you have several names there. The original name is the problem space, right? What problems do our does our well stakeholders, domain expert customers, users have? And let's create bounded context around them and then see how you integrate these models together. Um, and form APIs on top of them, specifically designed towards the interaction with the other models. Yeah. Right? So it, it really depends how you create your API, depending on the social interaction between it. These are the strategic patterns in DDD. So for instance, uh, a big, huge anti-pattern, people call it anti-pattern, which is not is the conformist pattern, which is say, well, I have a upstream, a domain, uh, upstream domain model, that I need to use in order to fulfill my responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, but I cannot say anything to them, right? There's no interaction possible, but I still need them. So that then you conform, and then you say, okay, let's not translate anything. Let's use their model as is, which is a well-known pattern, but it can be an anti-pattern if it's not designed correctly. But if you design it correctly, it's a cheap pattern. You just need to stay linked. And then there's the customer supplier pattern, and these have influence on the way you design your API because uh, depending on that interaction with the other teams, I'm trying to be more constrictive in my APIs or a bit more open in my APIs or a bit more standardized in my APIs. So it really depends on these contexts. And if you, what I see happening is usually people, when they go move to microservices, they tend to split on nouns or on services. So you get a user service or you get a, mm -hmm. um, an account service that that might still be useful, but you also get an uh, um, application service. But these don't really say anything to me. What what, what is their outcome or what is their uh, promise to me? What what are they serving? Right, they're just nouns. So within the DDD space, we say, okay, but what is what is it they trying to solve for me? And this is what I usually see at companies I consult is that they don't think in responsibilities or in, in outcomes. And Rebecca Wiersprock talk, talked a lot about responsibility-driven de development in the past before DDD. And I think that's the switch. We keep talking about services as if they're systems. So for an engineer, that might be, oh, this is a nice deployable service. While for a business, a service can mean, okay, what is the service you're delivering? And that ambiguity between the two collides usually because there's no shared language, hence what DDD solves. So I try to avoid the word service mm -hmm. and try to more work to what is this thing solving. For instance, I'm solving that I'm allocating seats. So, okay, I'm getting more meaning to my service, right? Mm -hmm. And that's for us, is for the DDD space is a bounded context. For that, you can create a uh, application boundary, so a deployable unit. And here, hence, sys a system, right? System in the is also an ambiguous word. So I try to work on that, right? Try to split the deployment boundary and that we keep we stop stop talking in deployment boundaries because that usually happens in an organization, right? We say, can you please uh, update surface X with blah, 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 blah. And, and that relates to, a serv to an actual deployment, but rather using contextual boundaries, which are the bounded context. Can you please in the seat allocator add this business rule? 
-hmm. And then we as software engineers will decide how we're going to implement that. And I think that's what usually I see from that perspective is it's going wrong, right? So we don't necessarily have that shared sense of uh, responsibilities anymore. So what is this actually solving? I hope that makes sense. And from it, there, it, build the API. It makes sense. But I think you're, you're actually already working with people that got their stuff together. Because I've seen, I've heard teams where basically they, they're like, we're a big bank. We've got lots of divisions, lots of teams. Yeah. They're all doing their own IT stuff. Um, they're now all doing APIs, and we've got lots of APIs, like hundreds. I'm working thousands. with these as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> so working with these as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. And and the thing is that they usually also have these big. Well, they call it monoliths, but they're usually yeah. big ball of muds. And I've been working with a larger company where I give the DDD training there. And I started with one team, really small, because I don't like to come in and and sell this whole thing. Okay, let's just start small with two days and. Let's ref let's go through a scenario in your uh, in your case, right? And let's see where these contextual boundaries should be. And then they figure out that they have several contextual boundaries and several different APIs before moving. They already have APIs like mm -hmm. SOAP or REST APIs, of course, maybe even GraphQL APIs. And and then I try to help them with with that case creating first the responsibility boundaries and then they can decide what kind of api they need for that mm -hmm. and 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 i get i i get the same thing from engineer because something you triggered they already have a bunch of apis and then at some point they say well we need we need to know uh one vision of the user and then i'm already in distress and i'm saying no 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 but what's the context of that user and why would you need it for who uh bring some clarity more and 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 that that's what you said at the start right it's creating that coherence but more coherence on responsibilities mm -hmm. and from there create apis instead of create apis on what you already have and and what you're saying they're creating thousands of apis under current design and that's same creating microservices on your current big ball of mud Yes. The only way you can split it is what you already know. And usually the engineers don't know anything about the business. Yeah. So how would they split on nouns? Because they think those are real objects. So then they get the account service and, and, uh, and the transaction service. And, and it's like, okay, but now they're just creating a distributed big ball of mud. Yeah. And they don't fit together, but they will make them fit in the end. And then you get more spaghetti between the distribution and then they make it even more complex and chaotic. And that's, yeah, that's what I usually see. <laughs> okay. Then then I think then that's the first uh, confirmation of my hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you need, yeah, go ahead, Mark. You were talking about moving from... Um, call them deployment boundaries to contextual boundaries um boundaries and organizations are usually um a reflection of conway's law as in mm -hmm. they reflect communication structure or the hierarchy or budgeting depending on how far back you want to trace it but so i assume this is not easy to do so moving the boundaries in a sustainable way so you say you're going in with the team uh, you're working two days, you work through a scenario, you start to sort of make them aware of the difference. Um, that sounds a little bit like I'm going in as an agile coach and I start to show them how the work flows and make them aware of different ways of looking at flow and optimize it. But so my common experience is even you go and you work with a team for six months, once you leave, if, if you just train a team here and there, six months later, everything is gone again. So how do you make these boundary changes sustainable? Yeah, it, it, it is not only two days training. For some, for some, it works. For some, it doesn't. I had this one company where it worked because I really focused on the bounded context pattern. So instead of the deployment boundaries, think of what, what is the purpose? Of course, that's the start of their whole journey. But if they're already creating boundaries based on language uh, with a domain model for a specific use in mind, and Eric Evans gives a very well introduction to the Mercator uh, map, right? That that's a model for a specific purpose. So I, I, I try to train them on that, but I also try to get the business involved straight away. 
if that's possible so that they or, or at least the po we always mention this so at least the po also thinks in that and the po sees the um how do you call it the 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 benefit of doing this so then you have the whole team there so i train the whole team it's it's not a tactical or a technical course it's really the whole team and that's why you have the po there as well that can help drive it right if i get for some reason a lot of po have the rank to to drive this as well so as long as i can also get the po on board i already have a bonus point if they see the value in it and a lot of po's I've trained so far are like, oh, finally I have a shared language and I can go to my stakeholders and give them in functional language an option that my developers now also understand. Uh, but that two days, I only focus mostly on that bounded context. And, and from there, they either pick it up because it already changes in their mind, right? Okay, oh, we need don't stop talking in this. Oh, there's ambiguity. So I put a high focus on ambiguity in language and you see the change slowly coming in. And what I do then after the training, we always do some lean coffee afterwards where I keep in touch and see how's it going. AS one out of 10 cannot pick up because they in so high cognitive load that they cannot do that. Um, and then we always apply or always say, okay, let's, I will go join them for a while. So I have like three days a, a fixed customer and I help them step by step uh, being the benevolent dictator uh, architect in that team and help them and then slowly move towards uh, architecture without software architects. So that, that, that I'm not sure who, who there's this nice, um, see I'm horrible in names, but there's this nice progression of you have four types of architects. So benevolent uh, architect in the team, architecture by the team and their inmates running the asylum. So uh, I try to then get inside, be the benevolent uh, architect uh, and then move them towards that right side and then help them. So that's also an option. And, uh, and I try to really focus on mentoring someone who can take that up. That is my sole purpose by, by being there. Um, and hopefully that, that change because I, I put the design in the team, so I let them design it. They reap the benefit in in six to nine months, and hopefully they continue. But you know, afterwards you never know, because it's a small team, and it's a part of a larger system again, which is the organization. And if there's a fractal pattern of not talking to the business, which we also see, yeah, then within within a year they might be back because they're uh, yeah, and and then I cannot do anything on that level. Then we really need to also train the the organization with them and help the organization change. Uh, thinking in, in, in these contextual boundaries. Yeah, so either a team is successful because they're allowed to do so, they have autonomy in, inside the company, then it's okay. If they're not, so what you're saying, the bigger banks, then it's harder, definitely, or harder maybe sometime. And, and we tell that upfront. And I'll we dropped straight in, so like there's some some of the more introductory questions yeah. that maybe uh, would be interesting to cover. Um, so one thing that we've been asking our guests, and well, you you're one of our first guests, so it's still fairly fairly fresh. But one pattern that I start seeing evolving is is um, like uh, well, one question we started asking everybody is how what's your experience with complexity and uh, and how do you talk about complexity? Do you, do you talk about complexity with your customers or is that something that's like, eh, you know, better stay away from the dark side or, or how, how, how is your experience with that? Oh yeah, that's a tough one. So I, in my training, I try to give a blunt introduction to Kinevin and talk mm -hmm. a bit about complexity to, to show them, uh, to, to really quickly help them Okay, what do you think the problem is and how to approach it? So to say, okay, if, you, if you're if you in here, we need to do more collaborative modeling. So from the DDD space, we do a lot of collaborative modeling. But I try not to give too much wording to things, like I'm coming in and doing domain-driven design. Then you take one session and they say, oh, this doesn't work, this domain-driven design, right? It's similar to like continuous delivery doesn't work, DevOps doesn't work here. So I try not to talk too much, but try to help them 
uh, experience by doing collaborative modeling. So we do a lot of event storming, and with event storming, you can actually let them experience the complexity. One of my favorite ones, if I if I can get them on that, is big picture event storming. That's how we call it. So we we take like uh, fifteen domain experts, so that can be product owners or business analysts, or actually the the users, the internal users of the system, uh, into the room of of a total business line. Get the top engineers and architecture in a room, so you you're you're roughly with twenty to thirty people, and we're gonna event storm their entire landscape, right? But from a functional point of view, so from a value stream point of view, and that's really chaotic. It takes a day, and from there they can witness and experience the complexity that's going on there, and from there I can help them and guide them into creating some more structure, but also telling them it continuously evolves, right? It, it's not static. Uh, right now you're doing it, right now you're forming your teams like this, but maybe uh, at some point you get a new product, you, you need to change your team setup. And and uh, my current customer, you, you see it, that they're having a lot of complexity because something is working that they started with one, one year ago, a new product, and now all of a sudden the entire uh, business starts getting on their thing. Oh, this is a new thing we started needed to work on. So yeah, the engineers are really frustrated with going left, going right, going left, going right, right? Uh, okay, new priority here, new priority there. And also the product owner you see switching there. And and what I try to help them with is constantly creating structure out of that chaos and having a sort of whirlpool in it. And I do that with mostly either event storming, use story mapping, example mapping, and bringing all these uh, collaborative tools in to create that coherence. And, and then you always get the but what about documentation uh, question, right? Uh, can can we document? And I said, yes, if something at some point get fixed, I would love to document it. But at this at this team, I'm trying to experiment with one big Miro board. They're a hybrid. So sometimes I go phys in a physical meeting, but sometimes we're in a hybrid meeting. So I create one Miro board where I, where I do all these things and then keep structuring it once we need it, right? Once we feel we need to structure it, we structure it and then reuse things. And Myra really helps there because it also has versioning uh, things. And that's how I try to create coherence of the knowledge by uh, constantly collaborating uh, in a modeling session, right? Um, that's how I try to not explain complexity, but let them deal with the incoherence of the language at least so that they, and they now start correcting me actually. Last time I, I used the word and then the PO came, Kenny, that's not, that's not the word we have been using now, right? We agreed on it. Oh, thank you. And then I was like, ah, first checkbox. <laughs> they started to correct me on the language they're using in that uh, collaboration. So, so for you, it is about, so you show complexity through uh, the lack of coherence and the experience of, of when things fall apart. Is that, that's a good characterization? Um, uh, yeah, and, and through that collaborative modeling. So I let them basically yeah. experience them through a collaborative modeling. And these are really simple, event storming is a really simple tool. Mm -hmm. The only problem is to get them uh, on board with it, right? That, because it's a big investment, a full day. And mm -hmm. uh, but, but then I show them the complexity, yes, through visualization and through letting them in, experience the incoherency. Because at that point they say, oh, I didn't know this. Oh, but you're using a different words. Oh, but and then from there create these uh, boundaries and and Jay Bloom said that right, dancing with uh, with boundaries and negotiating all the time. That's happening in that collaborative modeling session. Yeah, and try to create architectural decisions out of that. Okay, so we decided that let's create a structure more in the mindset, the shared shared mind. I tried to document it, but. For some reason, if it's too complex, I'm always running behind there. So I remember one time we finally, uh, after three sessions, got to a really, really simple flow. And, and there was someone who was a bit against it. So we got that person in and, ah, new insight. Great. Finally, we had it. Then I documented it in an activity diagram. And then one week later, I returned, and they're like, yeah, it's changed again. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but at least I did diagramming as code, so I can I can update it. So I'm still, yeah, finding a way to get that out, right? 
to to get okay should i document it and is it helpful or not but on one hand i think so but on the other hand it changes so fast and Hope I make sense there. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. It's it's really fascinating to hear the different answers. Um, like Jim Bloom talked about the having having something on the tip of your tongue that as like a personal experience of complexity. Um, but then it's interesting that for you it's a it's a group experience and and it's actually something that's part of your consulting. Uh, so I'm really really fascinated and excited to hear what other guests are going to say because uh, yeah. yeah. Same here. Good stuff. Very good. Stuff. See what I can learn from there. Yeah, I, I'm a really collaborative person. Try to uh, get it in, get them experience in a group. Especially in the IT, there's a usually a more focused polarity towards the I. Mm -hmm. You see it in the whole branching scene and 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 so much against pairing and ensemble uh, mob program. Right? There's a lot of resistance I see in the mm -hmm. community because there's so much focus on I just want to sit and code. Mm -hmm. So that's why I try to focus on collaboration while I do know that's the other side of the polarity, right? So I, you do need to manage when when to do what. Mm -hmm. So that that that's also uh, the problem. But I like to align through these collaborative uh, sessions. Like I love MOP or Ensemble programming. Tomorrow I'm going to do a refactoring again with uh, four people. I love to create coherence on, on these smaller ones, mm -hmm. but also on the bigger groups. Very cool. That also ties into how Dave Snowden talks about complexity in knowledge management, where he says in order to cope with complexity, you need what he calls multiple scanning, which is essentially groups of people looking at the same problem with diverse perspectives and diverse experiences that they bring to it, and then you find better solutions, then you find better um, attempts to get out of your problems, etc. Yeah. Yeah, and that's also coming from the deep democracy uh, uh, scene, uh, where they also say, right, uh, get these different insights out, because just getting a group of people together doesn't necessarily work as well with ranking and biases. And uh, but you get better, uh, better solutions because you get all the what what Woody Zool says about mob programming, right? All the great minds sitting behind one keyboard solving the problem. Uh, so I fully agree with that, especially in complex. If it's if it's a complicated problem like stable, okay, let's just let's just do an analysis, figure it out, and implement it. Right? It's just a stable process, fine. But the the where I'm now, everything changes continuously. The business changes continuously. The user changes continuously. So yeah, you you need to get people together more often. Fully agree just... with that talking there about deep democracy what, yeah what is deep democracy <laughs> so deep democracy was may created by arnold mindel uh i think in the 80s or 90s he's trying to combine uh, psychology with with uh, group so sociology and who quantum physica and some people might some people might see it as pseudo science which it might be it but there's a lot of good points what he make, and I really like the 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 core of it is is what they call role theory. So role theory, um, uh, there's several versions of it in the literature, and he calls it a role is everything that you have inside you. So it can be an emotion, but it can also be a a mother father role or an architect role. But we all have these, and what usually happens in group discussions is that they're getting fixated on a person right that's the person that's the architect so that person needs to make a decision and what they're trying to do in deep democracy is create these the, the make these roles fluid right if someone is like always always the 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 person that's going against the crowd right they call it the hari uh, like the, the the person that that that's always against then that person get labeled and they start ignoring that person right but there's more to that person and that's what role theory and that's what deep democracies try to do is through conversation, try to spread that role and create flu fluidity in the role so that not only that person is is uh, is the nagging person, but also the person that has a lot of ideas, right? And and what usually happens, and I have this example from a training to give a concrete example where 
uh, because it's a training, I sometimes don't finish the exercises. I sometimes do training on their domain. And that has a danger because you can get into too much complexity uh, that you cannot finish the exercise, right? But at least they did it on their own and hopefully. So after three times, we didn't finish one. And that guy was like, yeah, sorry to speak out, but can't we just finish it for once? Like he was really that harsh. And then you see people like, oh, it's this guy again. So everyone probably knows this situation. So what happens then is we usually start ignoring that person. Like we, we need to continue, but because you feel everyone's like, <sighs> and then I just ask the question, okay, so what I hear you say is that you want to finish it. Uh, what's the need underneath there? Uh, yeah, because I like to learn more about this thing. And then I ask the question to the group, who else more in the group has this feeling of, of this? And then suddenly people, I, I start raising my hands to create a visual aid, like people can speak up. And then three others start to do it slightly. And all of a sudden, so first the role fluidity, there's no role fluidity. That person is like, oh, this person again. And then all of a sudden it starts spreading around like, okay, multiple people have this. Okay, so what do we do now? So I said, okay, multiple people have this. And then it starts to solve itself because the group is like, oh, yeah, I can speak up now, right? It, it's safe to, to also have this feeling in the group. And that's the core of deep democracy is, is trying to create that fluidity, trying to get the conflicts out. So the unspoken words out, they call it fishes and, and spread that spread that need around of the conflict so that decisions are being made more easy because now we understand each other's needs instead of talking about the solution, right? I want to finish this is a solution, but what's the problem? What's the need? And that's what deep democracy goes in about and it's a really nice facilitation method to help deal with conflicts in groups and help them make better decisions this connects with nvc i think right because like the needs and uh, the solutions like um, it, it oh, so i've been learning about nonviolent communication yeah it's the same the same language that they use uh like uh what, what what's your needs that's underlying your solution that you're suggesting yeah yeah. yeah, the only thing that deep democracy does do is that at some point, right, you're talking about needs and create fluidity, but then it can start to polarize. So they can form two groups at some point. Uh, so you have really two options that goes against each other. And what deep democracy then says is now we need to get everything out of the table. So first of all, you need a psychological safe environment to do this, of course, but you go deeper. So now you say, okay, let's stretch out these polarities. Let's say everything, right? But also be mean to each other. It's fine. So then it's not non-violent, but it's a violent way in a... So just say everything. Everything needs to be put on the table. And then from there, you go back and say, okay, now that you heard everything, what does that do to you as a person? And what are you going to do different? So that's a big difference in deep democracy, right? You try to, you try to solve it with the non-violent part. But at, at some point, if there's no decision being made, that means, okay, we haven't set everything that has to be set. So let's see if we can stretch the, 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 the conflict up. And then, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So throw our, all arrows, they call it. So throw everything you got in yeah. this safe environment, right? We call it a safe environment. So that means there's a few rules that you need to, it's not yeah. personal, right? But also we finish this exercise. It's not that in the middle you can move away. No, yeah. we're finishing this. That's it's. Uh, I haven't done one of these, but I've I've heard Laura talk about appreciative inquiry. That sounds a little bit like this. Although, yeah, probably it's less. Wait, the the other thing that's is sparking for me is uh, Dutch culture. This is uh, you. You're so much more open than than we are here in Flanders. Uh, I would say that you you think, but we're rational open not emotional open in my yeah. and, and and going deep takes a more emotional approach so i yeah. think yes we are in, in the the dutch culture is really direct and rational open but i don't think it's really if if i look at myself as well it's not really you you're not direct about your fears right so for yeah. instance i was in a session of my own with my team last monday and something happened and i said well 
and I feel myself talking about the rational, right? Yeah, the process wasn't, I think the process get, needs to be better. Uh, we like talking about how the process gets better, right? And then all of a sudden, what am I doing? Actually, I'm pretty sad that this happened. So then I vocalize that I'm sad, but that's mm-hmm. uncomfortable yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Dutch culture. So uh, Okay. We're still still yeah, learning. I, I well massively appreciate um, yeah. the collaboration because it's it's different and always good stuff comes out. Yeah, 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 and that's what I love. And and uh, and what they say: a conflict, same as failure, is an opportunity to learn. Yeah, and for me, a conflict is already we disagree on a pain, a really rational opinions, right? Like, yeah. uh, uh, like for me, the conflict is already I like. Uh, this beer, you like that beer. Okay, now we're in a conflict, right? Conflict of opinion. So that's for me is already a conflict, but the harshness of conflicts, you need different approaches. And that's what deep democracy also says, right? Adjust your approach according to the culture. Okay. You don't, there, there's a structure in it, but please change it to the culture you're in. Yeah. Interesting, I'll look it up. Yeah, and uh, well, you have the Arnold Mindel part. So his book, Sitting in the Fire, is really nice because he talks more, more, more about process work, how to do it in large groups. And then you have the Lewis method, Myrna Lewis, and she picked that up and create a structured approach to it. So yeah. Arnold Mindel style is really chaotic and Arnold Mindel style is also more about putting up the heat, for instance. So if you're in a group, he always brings two facilitators to take both sides, right, of, of the process. And he gets out what they call ghost role. So if a manager isn't there, okay, I'm going to put that on the table. While um, Myrna Lewis is more a neutral facilitator, saying I'm I'm from everyone here. So there's two different approaches to, to uh, this side, to facilitation. Both work really well because the ghost role is also really nice, right? You can, you can, you can put up the roles that aren't there, but give them a speech to give more insights. But then you're, you're, you as a facilitator show color. So it can also mean, oh, I feel unsafe now with you as a facilitator. So that's mm-hmm. a trade-off. It's like architecture trade-offs. Interesting, very, very interesting. Yeah. That's it for the first episode with Kenny Bashwegler. You can learn more about him and his work at Basi.com. Tune in next time to hear the story why Kenny started using methods like deep democracy and explore further why most organizational change initiatives don't work. The Deliberate Complexity podcast arc is brought to you by Pronovix and Contextualize. You can learn more about our companies at pronovix.com and maturitymapping.com. Thank you for listening, and until next time, make sure to mind the context.